Richard Matsopoulos. Um, and I'd also just like to mention that this is the first time that I'm presenting this paper, so I'd value any feedback or comments that you might have. Okay, so the starting point of this project is that um, alcohol consumption has been a major topic um, of moral and public policy discussions for centuries. Um, so <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of context, historically, drinking alcoholic drinks was often safer than drinking the, the available water source. So as a result of this, alcohol consumption has become highly integrated into daily life in many societies and cultures around the world. Now, in the modern times, um, these policy discussions regarding optimal alcohol control uh, continue to persist. Now, when thinking about these, these discussions, there are several components that are important. So there are moral and political considerations. So for example, um, there's a tension between civil liberty versus state paternalism, but there are also evidence-based considerations. And so in order to guide these policy discussions, it's very important to understand from an evidential perspective how alcohol consumption affects health and well-being in society. So <clears throat> therefore it's essential to incrementally try to improve our understanding um, of the full impact of alcohol on society by collecting evidence um, on various dimensions. Okay, so there are several channels through which alcohol can influence uh, society. First of all, you of course have the direct uh, health impacts of alcohol. So for example, um, alcohol can lead to increased risk of several uh, non-communicable diseases. So some examples of this are liver cirrhosis, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and cancer. Then you also have the enjoyment of consumption of alcohol. So many people actually really value um, being able to consume alcohol. Um, third, you have the economic factors that relate to the influence of alcohol on society. <clears throat> so alcohol is highly integrated into many uh, societies around the world. So for example, you can think of the restaurant industry. Um, another way in which uh, alcohol relates to uh, society through economic factors is that it influence, influences the basket of consumption goods that individual households uh, consume. So if you removed alcohol from, from uh, society, this would influence the basket of goods that, that a household consumes and would influence the budget that they have available for other goods. Now, the, in, uh, the, <clears throat> the important channel for this paper is the behavioral impact of alcohol. Okay, so uh, consuming alcohol can influence uh, the way that individuals make decisions. So there are many outcomes that could, can potentially be influenced by the decision-making um, that is influenced by alcohol consumption. So you can think of the following outcomes, for example, uh, road traffic collisions, interpersonal violence, including gender-based violence, sexually transmitted diseases, pregnancy, work product, so productivity at work, savings decisions, parenting decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so in this paper, <clears throat> what we're going to be doing is focusing on a small set of these behavioral outcomes. Okay? So we're going to be actually looking at the impact of alcohol consumption on mortality due to unnatural causes. And mortality due to unnatural causes is mortality that results from um, things like for traffic collisions and interpersonal violence. So it's normally the result of individuals engaging in risky behavior that might be, might be influenced by alcohol consumption. Okay, so what are we doing in this paper? We're essentially evaluating the impact of the five week complete ban on the sale and transport of alcohol that occurred in South Africa starting in July in, of this year, so July, 2020. So since this is a South African audience, I'd just like to mention that we're not evaluating the impact of the first alcohol ban that occurred during lockdown. And I'll come back to why we, why we don't look at that one. Okay, <clears throat> in this paper, we're examining um, only one important outcome. So we're only looking at mortality due to unnatural causes. And when I talk about mortality due to unnatural causes, what I'm talking about is, as I've already mentioned, 
is deaths due to things like road traffic collisions, violence, accidents, suicide, and things like this. Okay. Now to give you a preview of the results, what we, are going, what, what we show in this paper is that the sales ban essentially reduced the number of unnatural deaths occurring in South Africa by 21 per day. Now this is a substantial uh, reduction in unnatural mortality, and it corresponds to a 14% reduction in all unnatural mortality in South Africa. I will come back to this, but actually we, we will argue that this is a lower bound of the impact of the, um, of the ban. We will also show that uh, this effect was confined almost entirely to men. So we observed no impact of the alcohol sales ban on the unnatural mortality of women. And we will also show that half, approximately half of this reduction was observed in younger men. So um, this is males aged 15 to 34 years of age. In addition, we will document that there are several um, interesting systematic regularities in unnatural mortality. So these, un these systematic regularities in unnatural mortality are documented using data from 2017 to 2019. So this is prior to 2020. And what we see is that there's a very strong day of the week effect and also a very strong day of the month effect in unnatural mortality. So we observe far higher um, levels of unnatural mortality on the weekend. And we also observe far higher levels of unnatural mortality towards the end and the beginning of the month. So one reason that you might think that this occurs is due to a payday effect. Now this paper relates to, you know, there's, there's a lot of literature examining um, the impact of alcohol on society on various outcomes in society. So I've just put down some examples of, of papers in this literature. So, you know, there's a sub, sub literature that's looking at the impact of alcohol during the, um, or the impact of the absence of alcohol during the prohibition in the US during the early 20th century. There's a very interesting piece uh, by Bhattacharya Charya et al. Um, that's examining um, the Gorbachev anti-alcohol anti campaign during the 1980s. There's lots of work that looks at you know, shifts in, um, in legal in laws. So for example, um, when there are changes in the minimum drinking age or the drink driving laws, then individuals use this exogenous variation to examine what the impact is on on outcomes such as uh, sexual behavior, um, car, car crashes, um, and mortality. Um, there's also you know, a set of papers that look at uh, shifts in, in alcohol trading hour regulations. So for example, Marcus and Siedler look at um, the impact of a shift in trading hour regulations um, on hospitalization rates of youth in Germany. And then there's also, um, there's also um, several papers in the health sciences which model the impact of alcohol. <clears throat> Sorry, could you check that your um, microphone is, is off? Thank you. Um, so um, now I'd just like to give you some, some context. Um, so the, the World Health Organization releases um, a global status report every couple of years. So the most recent one that I know of is the 2018 version. Um, so this is the global status report on alcohol and health in, in the world. And so this is useful for giving a little bit of context um, in terms of um, the impact of alcohol worldwide and in relation to the impact, um, so in relation to alcohol within the consumption of alcohol within South Africa. So if you consider the world as a whole, um, the average uh, adult, so thinking of individuals aged 15 and all, older, um, consumes uh, 6.4 liters of pure alcohol. So this is looking at data from 2016. Um, so that's, of course, not 6.4 uh, liters of alcoholic drinks, but 6.4 liters of pure alcohol. Now, the report shows that, the, um, that males, that's sorry, that 57% of males were drinkers and 32 th around 32% of females were drinkers. So what is meant by a drinker? 
Um, this is someone that has had at least one or reports having had at least one uh, alcoholic drink within the preceding 12 months, okay? And this report also shows that approximately 29% of males and 7% of females engaged in heavy episodic drinking. So heavy episodic drinking is defined as um, having at least one session in which you drink or which you consume at least 60 grams of alcohol within the preceding 30 days, okay? Uh, 60 grams of alcohol is a lot. So just for context, it corresponds to almost an entire bottle of wine. So 625 milliliters of wine or about four and a half beers, okay? Now for comparison, let's look at South Africa. <clears throat> so the same World Health Organization report um, states that um, in South Africa, the average male consumes uh, 16 liters of alcohol, of pure alcohol per year. And the average female consumes around 2.7 liters of pure alcohol in, in, in the year. Around 43% of males are, are drinkers under the same classification. And around 19% of females in South Africa are drinkers. And looking at heavy episodic drinking, we see that again, males are engaging in heavy episodic drinking much more than females. So around 30% of males in South Africa engage in heavy episodic drinking, while only around 6% of females. Okay. I'd also like to note that you know the drinking behavior in South Africa is not too, too different to the worldwide averages. Okay, so could think of uh, drinking behavior in South Africa as being somewhat related to the average um, around the world. Okay, now turning to um, unnatural uh, mortality due to unnatural causes, in South Africa, we observe around 50,000 deaths due to unnatural causes per year. And again, we see a big difference between men and women. So about four out of five of every one of these unnatural deaths is, uh, is amongst men. Okay. So it's important for this paper to understand uh, the policy timeline. So since a lot of, I think a lot of people in the audience are, are from South Africa, I guess, um, you know, you already know most of this, but I'd just like to refresh your, your memory and maybe point out one or two key, key factors. So on the 27th of March, uh, South Africa entered, um, you know, the full lockdown, the level five lockdown, um, this then, transition to uh, level four lockdown. And then on the 1st of, of June, 2020, um, South Africa moved to level three, okay? And in the middle of the level three period, so on the 12th of, on Sunday, the 12th of July, uh, Sur Ramaphosa announced that there would be a second um, alcohol ban. Sorry, I should mention. So during level five and level four, there was the first alcohol ban. Then on the 1st of June, 2020, the first alcohol ban was ended and alcohol was again sold during the first part of level three. Then on the 13th, so on the 12th of July, the second alcohol ban was announced. And on the morning of the 13th of July, which is a Monday morning, the second alcohol ban, which I refer to as the July alcohol ban, uh, came into force. So the important um, thing for this paper is that we have two periods, both within the level three um, policy period, which have a similar set of regulations in place, but during the second half of the level three policy period, there is the alcohol ban, whereas in the first half of the level three, uh, level three policy period, there was no alcohol ban. So <clears throat> we argue in, in the paper that uh, most regulations stayed relatively constant throughout the level three policy period. Um, the main exception to this is that along with the alcohol ban on the 13th of July, there was a curfew that was all, also introduced. Now, we, we argue in the paper that this curfew was unlikely to be the main driver of um, changes in unnatural mortality. There are several reasons for this. Um, one is that before the curfew was introduced, individuals were not meant to be leaving their uh, their residences at night without a valid reason. Um, the second reason is that we, we can look at the change in the length of the curfew, which occurred on the 31st of July, 2020. So this was halfway, um, so this was in the middle of the alcohol ban period. 
So we can look at whether this reduction in the length of the curfew shifted unnatural mortality. And uh, just to preview that result, we find that it did not. And the third reason is that on the 18th of August, when the alcohol ban was terminated, so South Africa moved to level two, the curfew remained in place, but unnatural mortality levels returned to pre-2020 levels. So if the curfew had been the main factor keeping uh, unnatural mortality levels down, one would expect that on the 18th of August, mortality levels wouldn't have risen as much as they did. Okay, but I'll come back to this. All right, let me now turn to some descriptive evidence. Um, by the way, if anyone has any pressing questions, feel free to, to ask them, but otherwise we can discuss anything that we have. Okay, so what is the data that we have? Um, so the, the data that we're analyzing here is um, daily mortality data. Um, so from the 1st, 1st of January, 2017 to the 13th of September, 2020. So I also have data from 2016, but in the main analysis, I'm using it from 2017. We are only studying deaths due to unnatural causes, as I've already mentioned. So this excludes, for example, um, deaths due to COVID-19 and other natural causes. And in most of the analysis that I'm going to be discussing, we're considering the unit of, of, of observation as being an individual day. Okay, so there are a couple of figures that look at weekly, um, that analyze weekly, uh, that the unit of observation is weekly, but for most of the analysis, it's an individual day. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is an example of weekly of a weekly figure. So what have I plotted here? Essentially, what you see here is a weekly, um, weekly mortality, so due to unnatural causes um, over time. So I plotted here um, mortality in 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Okay. The vertical uh, black lines refer to the transition to level five, then level four, then level three. So you can see that during the full lockdown, um, you know, the blue line goes down. This indicates that there was a large reduction in unnatural mortality during this uh, full lockdown, which also had an alcohol ban, as I've mentioned before, but we're not studying this. Then you see that unnatural mortality uh, in 2020 um, went up again at the end of level three and it returned to a level that was close to pre-2020 level, uh, pre pre-2020 uh, levels of unnatural mortality. Then the green vertical line indicates the beginning of the, of the July uh, alcohol ban. And the red vertical line uh, indicates the end of the July alcohol ban. So it sort of appears as if uh, unnatural mortality again went down during this uh, July alcohol ban. So <clears throat> the analysis that we're conducting is essentially comparing um, this alcohol ban period between the green and the red line with the period immediately preceding the alcohol ban. So this is the, the, <clears throat> the period that is between the, to the left of the green line and between the black line and the green line, basically. Another thing that I'd like to point out in this figure is that if you look at the pre-2020 um, unnatural mortality um, lines, what you see is a zigzag pattern. So the, um, the reason for this zigzag pattern is that there's actually a monthly, um, so as I've mentioned, there's a monthly pattern in unnatural mortality. So you see an increase in unnatural mortality at the beginning and the end of the month, and this explains um, the zigzag pattern. Okay. Sorry, I, saw, I think I saw that someone wrote something in the chat, but I, um, if someone has a question, please unmute yourself and ask it. Um, it's, it's just a question about recording the presentation, so. Um. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay, let me uh, turn to uh, daily, um, so figure that presents the same data, but at a daily frequency. So what you see here is basically um, daily unnatural mortality. What's important here is that 
um, since our natural mortality follows a weekly pattern, I've aligned days of the week. Okay, so I basically count from the first Monday of the year and I align uh, our natural mortality across the four years that I'm considering. So what you can see is that you know every, every week there's a peak, this is the weekend. And what's kind of striking is that you know the pattern of unnatural mortality is incredibly regular from year to year. I mean, prior to 2020, of course. Again, you can see um, between level five, you know, between March and, and June, you see this drop in unnatural mortality. So you have no weekend effects, basically. Then, um, you know, to the left of the green line, you again see this. Um, first part of the level three period where you start to see um, weakened effects on unnatural mortality again. And then between the green and the red line, you again see a slightly lower level of unnatural mortality. Okay. Um, now this is again showing you the day of the week effects, just um, using data from 2017 to 2019. And also um, shows you the difference in unnatural mortality between men and women. So you can see that far, uh, there's far more unnatural mortality amongst men than amongst women. And it just illustrates what I've already said that um, on Saturdays and Sundays, there are far more people dying from unnatural causes or both for men and women, but especially for men um, on Saturdays and Sundays. Okay, so it's at least 50% more people dying um, from unnatural causes on Saturdays and Sundays. Now, <clears throat> Here we see unnatural mortality uh, by day of the month, again, using data only from 2017 to 2019. Um, you should basically, well, yeah. So you can see that, um, so focusing on men, because you know there's far more deaths amongst men, you see that there's a higher number of, um, of deaths on at the beginning and at the end of the month, yeah, especially at the beginning of the month. Now, I think that what's more useful is to try to combine the, um, the day of the month and the day of the week um, into a single figure. Um, because as I've mentioned before, one hypothesis that you can have is that, um, is that the day of the month effect is driven by you know, payday. So what I've done here is essentially try to align. So I've tried to um, plot the day of the month so mortality by day of the month, but aligning um, the, the weekdays, right? So the way that I've done this is that I've, <clears throat> to, I've counted the first Saturday that follows the last Monday of the previous month as day t equals zero. The reason for doing this is that it, it would be, this will essentially ensure that I align the first weekend um, that follows the last weekday of the preceding month. So I use the last weekday of the preceding month as a proxy for a payday. And so this al allows me to align weekend days and days of the week and also to align um, payday weekends. So what you see is that, you know, the, you see again these, these weekend spikes um, where unnatural mortality is far higher. But you also see that unnatural mortality appears to be a bit higher even on the first weekend of the month. Okay. So, but this is all descriptive evidence. I just wanted to familiarize you with the data. Um, and then, sorry, last thing, um, you can also look at the month of the year and you see that unnatural mortality is not too different according to month of the year, except in December. Although I was slightly surprised that January was, um, was not higher. Okay. So now I've shown you the, the descriptive evidence, just um, how, uh, how there are systematic regularities in unnatural mortality in, in the data prior to 2020. Um, what's important is that we need to account for these systematic regularities in the data in our, in our analysis, okay? So in our main analysis, what are we doing? Um, it's quite a simple, simple analysis. Um, essentially, what we're doing, as I've, as I've already described, is comparing uh, the level of unnatural mortality in 2020 during the alcohol ban period with 
the level of unnatural mortality during the period immediately preceding the alcohol ban. Um, now, what we can do is we can use um, previous year, the data from previous years to also control for the day of the week, day of the month, and year fixed effects. So doing this, we estimate the following uh, model using OLS. So we estimate a model <laughs> which has a dummy variable for the level three calendar period. So this variable also takes a one during you know, years 2017 through 2019, um, but only for the, you know, for the corresponding calendar period of the level three period in 2020. We have a dummy variable for the alcohol ban calendar period. And then we interact both of these variables with the dummy variable for 2020. We also include day of the week and day of the month and year fixed effects. And what we're interested in here is the coefficient estimates on the interaction term of the alcohol ban. Okay. So <clears throat> here are the estimates for um, the population as a whole, and we're not separating men and women in these estimates. So, you know, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the main coefficient that we're interested in here is the one that is the, you know, the coefficients for the variable that's represented in bold. Um, so that's the interaction term between the alcohol ban period and the 2020 dummy. And we have three different specifications. Our preferred specification is in the C column, which includes the, you know, the, the full array of fixed effects. Um, but actually our estimates are pretty similar across all three specifications, okay? So essentially what this is saying is that um, the, number of, uh, the number of daily deaths due to unnatural causes was reduced by around 21 to 22 and a half um, deaths per day during the alcohol ban period. Okay. Interestingly, you can also see that there was, you know, there's a, you can see here the strong weekend effect um, pre, pre, so the first, the weekend dummy shows the weekend effect prior to 2020. And then the interaction term with the weekend effect shows the reduction in the weekend effect during the 2020 data that we, we're looking at. But as I said, the main uh, focus here is on the interaction term with the alcohol ban period. Okay. We can also <clears throat> look at the, the results by gender. So here we separate men and women. Um, and here what we see is that for men, we again estimate that the reduction in the number of unnatural deaths due to, sorry, the number of unnatural deaths was 21, approximately 21 per day. So this is interesting because this is the same as the previous estimate. So it suggests that all of the reduction in unnatural mortality was amongst men. And you know, this is supported by the fact that we observe no significant um, <clears throat> change in unnatural mortality for women during the alcohol ban. Remember that in general, the number of unnatural deaths amongst women is far lower. We can now do the same for, for younger adults. So this is the, you know, the group of younger adults who are between 15 and 34 years. And we estimate that the alcohol ban reduced the number of deaths amongst younger adults by around 11 per day during this period. Okay, so those are the, those are the main results. Um, and just to summarize, um, we see a reduction of 21 deaths per day during the alcohol ban period. This corresponds to um, around 740 40 fewer deaths um, over the entire five week period. Um, this, by the way, it's 36 days, so it's not 35 days, um, in case you're checking my math. Um, so this entire effect was confined to men. We find no, no effect for women. And approximately half of this reduction is observed amongst younger men, where we observe 11 fewer deaths per day. Now, um, we conduct several robustness exercises in the paper. So there are several things that, that you may be worried about with these results, and especially in, 
in trying to interpret them as, as causal estimates. So we try to address um, some of these concerns in the paper, but in case uh, you have any additional concerns, I'd be happy to hear about them um, yeah, in the discussion period. So um, I think I have time to go through some of them. So one thing that you might be concerned of uh, concerned about is, is the curfew that changed at the same time as the alcohol ban. So I've already discussed this a little bit. Um, and yeah, so essentially we argue that we don't believe that the curfew was a main drive of the change in unnatural mortality that we observed. And you know, the way that we do this is we, we examine the one hour shift in the curfew length that occurred in the middle of the alcohol ban period. We show that this shift in the length of the curfew, so this uh, reduction in the length of the curfew, when the curfew began, when the start of the curfew was changed from 9 p.m. till 10 p.m., this had absolutely no uh, significant impact on the levels of unnatural mortality. Um, in addition, you know, as I've mentioned before, when you look at uh, the levels of unnatural mortality that occurred after the July alcohol ban ended mortality levels actually returned to their pre-2020 levels. So they rose sharply, even though the curfew remained in place. Okay, a second thing that you might be concerned about is that, um, of course, there was a, a pandemic going on. And so this can affect risky behavior. So fear of the pandemic could affect risky behavior. And this could um, you know, reduce the levels of unnatural mortality that we observe. So this would be a problem for our results if the level of fear of COVID-19 increased at the same time as the alcohol ban started. Now, what we show in the paper, and I can also show you a figure if you want during the discussion section, is that um, during the first part of the level three period, the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases was rising rapidly and then during the July alcohol ban period, the number of COVID-19 cases actually was dropping rapidly. So in order for our results to be driven by an increase in fear, this increase in fear would have, ha would have had to occur when the number of COVID-19 cases was dropping. And so we argue that it's unlikely that fear was higher when cases were falling sharply than when they were rising sharply. So therefore, we don't think that this is driving our results. If anything, it could lead to our results being an underestimate of the true effect size. Now, we also uh, run several placebo regressions. So essentially, what we do here is we, we, we run the same uh, regressions as in our main results, but we replace 2020 with 2019. So we're just comparing 2019 with 2016 through 2018, instead of comparing 2020 with 2017 through 2019. And this evidence uh, that we report here shows um, that our results are not driven by the estimation strategy that we use. Now, another thing that, <clears throat> that you might be concerned about is that at the very beginning of the level three period, there was um, an increase in unnatural mortality. So this was at, you know, at the end of the lockdown, um, when the first alcohol ban ended, there was a sharp increase in unnatural mortality. I think um, maybe a lot of people were, were drinking a bit more. Um, you know, to celebrate coming out of lockdown, or there's many reasons why, why this might have occurred. That's pure speculation, sorry. Um, but anyway, this might be a worry for our, for our estimation if you think that this is driving the results. So in order to, um, to alleviate this concern, what we do is we replicate our, our results, but um, use different estimation windows. Instead of considering the entire level three period, um, we, we consider different um, estimation windows. So we consider a five, a four, a three, and a two week, uh, two week um, estimation window on each. Um, oh, wow, someone can draw on my screen, I think. Anyway, 
um, we consider different window lengths on each side of the um, of the 13th of July implementation of the alcohol ban. Um, and we show that our results are robust for all of these window lengths, except for the two week window length. And we discuss two reasons why this might be the case. The first is that um, individuals may have taken some time to deplete their stocks of alcohol um, after the implementation of the alcohol ban. So therefore there may have been a lagged effect on unnatural mortality. A second reason is that if you look at the 13th of July, in the two weeks um, prior to the 13th of July, there's often a, a payday weekend. And in the two weeks after the 13th of July, there generally is not a payday weekend. So when we, we limit our, our window length to only two weeks, you have a payday weekend on one side and not a payday weekend on the other side. And that can affect our, our estimates. Um, and so that could be one reason why we don't see the, the effect for two week um, interval. And then the last robustness exercise that we do is that we um, replicate our main results, but only use data from the level three calendar period. Um, so we only use data from the calendar period between the 1st of June and the 17th of August for 2017 to 2020. And these results support our, our main findings. Um, I am happy to show you some of the evidence on any of these placebo exercises during the discussion period, if, you, if you'd like. Okay, but for now I will conclude. <clears throat> so what I've discussed in, in this talk is that um, we provide evidence or we document evidence of a large impact um, that this five week absence of legally acquired alcohol had on unnatural mortality levels um, in South Africa during the July alcohol ban. Now, I prefer to interpret this as demonstrating the impact that the impact of the presence of alcohol um, on society. Okay. So it, I prefer to interpret it as the impact that alcohol has on society during normal times. Um, as opposed to estimating the impact of the absence of alcohol. Um, now, in the paper, we also argue that the estimates that we provide are essentially a lower bound on, this, on the true effect size of alcohol on unnatural mortality. Um, I've already mentioned one reason, which is that if fear of COVID-19 played a role, um, then this would have actually uh, led to a downward bias in, in our estimates of the magnitude of the effect of alcohol on, on our natural mortality. We also discussed several other reasons and I'm happy to, to go back to this if you'd like. Now, one thing that's important is that, um, is that there are several caveats to these results. Um, so the first, first very important caveat is that one should not extrapolate from the results that I've discussed here um, to predict what the impact of a longer term ban on alcohol would be. Now, if you implement a longer ban on alcohol, it's likely that behavior in society is going to change substantially and society will enter maybe a new equilibrium. And that new equilibrium may, may involve um, an expansion of the black market may involve more criminal behavior and other, other unintended consequences. Okay. So I'm, yeah, so, you know, one should not extrapolate from the estimates about the impact of a short term ban to the impacts of a longer term ban. If one does wish to try to limit um, alcohol consumption in society, there are many different levers that one can, can use to do this. And one, uh, one example of where this is discussed is the World Health Organization has a safe initiative. A second important caveat is that in this paper, we are only discussing a single dimension of the influence of alcohol on society. So as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, 
there are many different channels through which alcohol can influence um, society. And in order to guide policymaking, it is essential to consider the full picture. So it's very important to collect evidence on all the relevant outcomes, both the harms and the benefits in order to get this full picture. And the last thing I'd just like to say is that, you know, as I've mentioned, we just uh, examine a single outcome here. But this July alcohol ban um, serves as a, a very good natural experiment for studying many outcomes. So the impact of alcohol on, on many different outcomes. So just a couple of examples um, is, you know, that one could consider. One can examine the impact on hospitalizations, on gender-based violence, on sexually transmitted diseases, on in utero alcohol exposure, on the impact of in utero alcohol exposure on later life outcomes, and on savings rates, et cetera, et cetera. But I leave all of this to future work, and I'd just like to thank you very much for your attention. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this is the first time presenting this. Um, so if you have any comments or suggestions, or if you'd like to uh, see a draft of the paper, please email me. Um, thank you very much.